Some are saying S&P is going to go from, you know, 4,000, it's around 3950, 3980 to 35. There's a small community that says it could go as little as as low as 32, which would be a 20% drop off. But for the most part, a lot of people are saying there's going to be a 10% decline over the next three to nine months. And it's important to know what to do in a situation like this and how it affects you. So in this webinar, I'll be sharing with you the mindset and the attitude needed in order to capitalize on the wealth uh, transfer that will be taking place. It's not the kind of wealth transfer that you and I think about that boomers are getting rich. They're transferring their money over to the next generation, and that's a wealth transfer. This is going to be a different kind of a transfer. Okay, so I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Masterworks. Let me tell you why you need to know about this company, why they now have 660,000 members, and why a lot of people in Miami at Art Basel, these big companies like Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs are going and talking to clients about investing in art. What do you mean art? Well, because last year, the top auction houses in America did $18 billion, record-breaking. Last year, art rate of return was 26%. So billionaires and millionaires are saying, maybe I need to think about art as an alternative asset. The challenges for many years, low, you know, you guys that are making 100 grand a year, 200 grand a year, 300 grand a year, it's like, I can't buy a million-dollar painting. I can't buy a $10 million painting. But you can buy shares of it now in a Picasso, in a Banksy, through Masterworks. And they do all the research. They vet out to see if the painting is this, if all the liabilities on them, they go through SEC. Everything they need to do to be structured to the SEC, they do it. You simply are able to go and buy a share with these guys. So there's a waiting list to be a member at Masterworks, but you can skip that by going to masterworks.art forward slash valuetainment. Once again, masterworks.art forward slash valuetainment or click on the link below in the description. Let's get right into it. Couple things here, Silicon Valley Bank. What really happened there? If you look at this chart, if you look at this chart, you'll see the blue, the light blue, not the dark blue on the bottom. The the blue, light blue is showing assets. And just five years ago, Silicon Valley Bank was a $50 billion company in assets. And it was $50 billion in 17, in 18, in 19, in 20 it went up. And then all of a sudden it went from being a $50 billion bank to 2022 being a $200 billion bank, and then deposits followed as well. But the number you want to look at there is that orange color that all of a sudden goes up. What is the orange you know, graph that we're looking at? What is the orange color that we're looking at? So a few things happen here. COVID stimulus, influx of tech startups, okay? Silicon Valley Bank buys a $100 billion three-year bond at an average of 1.7% interest rate. So here's how this works. They buy a $100 billion bond from the government. It's safe. It's going to give them 1.7%. They're thinking they're doing great because everything is a lot lower than that. Remember, interest rates were super low. So like, oh, this is great. We'll be selling it back to customers that are coming to us. It's going to be fine. All of a sudden, it goes to 2.7%. Two and a half, you know, three percent, four percent, five percent. Because we can't do this, we can't sustain this year. What do we do here? So next thing you know, the chart right here is loan assets and deposits in 2022. But look what happens here with their interest rates of the bonds that they bought. You see the orange? That's the bonds that they bought at 100 billion dollars in 2022, March 2022, a little bit before March 2022. That's three years. Next thing you know, Fed rapidly and unexpectedly raises rates to 5% in one year. We're going to look at history on how many times this has ever happened in our economy. I'll show you the history of it. Two, cash inflows slow down and withdrawals increase as tech startups are crushed by higher rates. Suddenly, people are running to Silicon Valley Bank. Word spreads about Silicon Valley Bank vulnerable position. Deposits withdrawals escalate. They're forced to sell $21 billion of bonds at a $1.8 billion loss to meet withdrawals. Once they sell the loss, this becomes realized. It's official. And then the FDIC is forced to intervene. The next thing you know is when we hear about Silicon Valley Bank's about to go out of business. One of the 27 regional banks that we have in America. And then that fear starts going into people saying, could it happen to me? Could it happen to my bank? Could it happen to a community bank? 
And next thing you know, people lose their minds on Twitter. The government needs to come and bail them out. This is not good. If you keep listening, what if the next bank? What if this? What if that? And everybody's now calling each other. Next thing you know, you know, Chase, uh, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase is coming, and those clients from Silicon Valley banks are moving their billions of dollars of money to Chase. Via they got $20 billion. Everybody's trying to get these clients at the same time. But what people are thinking about is, these, these families are sitting there saying if they only save, you know, protect up to a quarter million dollars, babe, maybe we need to save, move some of our money. So watch what happens. $42 billion in one day. One day Silicon Valley Bank runs the bi- run biggest in more than a decade when this happened. $42 billion went out in one day, most in a decade. So how did this happen? COVID pandemic put people out of work. At first, we're like, this is not a big deal. The government's sending us money. We're going to be fine. This whole, you know, $1,000 a month, $1,400 a month, this is great. Andrew Yang was right. We should send money to people. We can't afford to do it. Well, guess what? We printed around $6 trillion in the last three years, the Federal Reserve and the government. $6 trillion. That's a lot in three years. Here's what happened to us. The last time our national debt, GDP to national debt ratio, when you look at this year, was 100%, was 1945, right after World War II. That's, that's catastrophic when you go back and have to go to that number to see when's the last time we were there. So the government is sitting there. It's like a car driving at an 8,000 RPM. And boom! Engine blows up. You can't do this for too long. So we're looking at the scene. Wait a minute, 98.2% at during COVID 2020? Yeah, it went close to 130% at some point. And if this thing continues with the debt to GDP ratio, look what it can go to next in 2030, 2040. So the Fed is sitting there concerned. What are we gonna do about this? The government's sitting there concerned. President's sitting there concerned. Wall Street's sitting there concerned. Everybody's sitting there concerned saying, how are we gonna handle this? What are we gonna do about this? Well, Government regulation intensified, fracking permits cut, and oil pipelines canceled. Cancellation of Keystone pipelines resulted in thousands of construction jobs lost, billions in financial impact. All of this is going on. Then you got the Russia-Ukraine war, created additional supply issues. Some said oil, you know, the Nord Stream pipeline. Who did it? Was it U.S.? Was it Russia? Was it NATO? Who was involved in this thing here? We don't know, but that created a bunch of ruckus. Bottom line, money supply went up and available goods went down, okay? What happens when this takes place? People have money, but we don't have available goods. Inflation goes wild. Prices start going up. Too slow, too fast for us to respond. The Fed held 0% interest rates and purchased $120 billion dollars per month of treasuries and mortgage-backed mortgage back securities, which is called quantitative easing. They buy from banks, right? They're buying instead of taking money out, they're putting money in, right? Quantitative tightening, let's take money out of the market. Quantitative easing, let's put money in the market. This is what we're doing during COVID. Throw, print some more money. Put the money in there. Put the money in the economy. Okay, okay, look how much. Man, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poor. But damn, this is awesome. Look at all these policies. How great are they, man? And then why are the richer getting richer? Because bad policies have consequences. And no matter how much money you print and put into the economy, guess what the rich know how to do? Save, invest, and grow their money. Guess what the poor know how to do? Spend and waste their money. And when they spend and waste their money, who does it go to? Companies owned by the rich. So as much as it was a noble thing to do, the disparity between the rich and the poor got wider and wider and wider. Even though the intentions were noble, it became catastrophic. Let me continue. Jerome Powell says, well, you know, we believe inflation is going to be transitory and nobody's worried about it. It's a couple of years ago. We're like, ah, it's fine. It's going to be no, not a big deal. It's good. Suddenly pivots and starts aggressively raising rates like never before. And here's what it looks like. Zero percent interest rate hikes for two years. If you look at the bottom left, it says July 2020 up until January 2022. We're not doing anything. Then all of a sudden we raise five percent in one year. What happens when you raise rates 5% in one year? Well, let's see how many times we've done this before. But before we do so, what happens here? So Fed hiking rates achieved price stability, caused a shock to the banking sector, like ways we've never seen before, okay? You don't see it, but behind closed doors, like, oh, my God, these banks are about to have a heart attack. On the outside, they're walking, they're fine. On the inside... This heart is having to pump so hard and it can't keep up. Boom. 
then he got a heart attack. So unprecedented action they have to take. Normally, FDIC only insures deposits up to 250. That's what the number is. Government guaranteed all Silicon Valley Bank depositors. We've not done this before. 90% of Silicon Valley Bank deposits were over a quarter of a million dollars. This is Silicon Valley, so the clientele is slightly different. So it's not like it's Everybody's going to be fine. No, 90% is not going to be fine because they have more than a quarter million dollars in it. So who's paying for this? You know, is it going to be taxpayers? No, it's not going to be taxpayers. It's the FDIC. You don't have to worry about it. Biden said the taxpayers are not going to pay for it, but did not explain how the taxpayers are not going to pay for it. What are you going to do? Are you going to print some more money and not tell us about it and just put it on the balance sheet? I mean, you would never do that, right? That would never happen with the Fed. Well, maybe... We'll see what actually happens. So are more banks at risk? This is the question everybody's been asking the last two weeks, okay? Is Charles Schwab about to go down? Is the next band, you know, Credit Suisse, what, what happened there? $10 billion, 12 days. You know, if companies like this, well, they've been bad for four years. It's not a new thing. Well, Schwab's been irresponsible for, they would, no, that would never happen to Schwab. All these names, and I'm not just telling you Schwab's one of them. There's a lot of lists that people are talking about behind closed doors. So what is this chart here? Here's what this chart shows us here. When, when the moment everybody looked at Silicon Valley Bank to see what percentage of their asset under mass uh, management was under bonds, was allocated to bonds, everybody started looking at this chart. So Silicon Valley Bank, 63% of their assets was in bonds. You know how they bought a $100 billion bond over a three-year period at 1.7%? So that $100 billion, and there were $200 billion, including on another $30 billion, they have about 63% of all their assets is tied to bonds. So who looks safe here? Who looks risky here? J.P. Morgan Chase is the safest bank out there, what everybody started talking about. Only 15% is tied to bonds. Then it's B of A, 26%. Then it's City, 34 Then it's Wells. Then you got U.S. Bank. Then you got PNC. Then you got some of these other names. Goldman Sachs, Sachs sitting at 52%. TD Waterhouse, Capital One. And then you got uh, Morgan Stanley private at 63%. But then some of the other names are like, wait a minute, I know these banks. W what's going to happen with HSBC? If you look at HSBC, 70%. W what's going to happen with Comerica Bank? I know Comerica Bank. How about First Horizon? How about Frost? How about CIBC? 79% is long-term bonds or bonds? What are we talking about here? Should we be worried? Is this going to happen to my bank? Odds are, if you're watching this, one of those is your bank that you're banking with. Odds are, if you're watching this, one of those is a bank you're banking with. If some of you are saying, nope, I don't bank with any of those, you may be banking with a community bank. And a community bank is for cities with less than 50,000 people of population. It's a smaller community banks. It's a smaller cities that have you know banks that size. You may be with one of those. But everybody started looking at the banks to the right of Silicon Valley. And that's a lot of names. Could they be next? And talk starts. Well, if it can happen to them, it can happen to others as well. So then, all of this stuff they're talking about, the FDIC says, no, you don't need to worry about it. We got it covered. We're going to be fine. This is the FDIC. We got plenty of money. We're sitting there. And then some people became curious and they said, well, how much is the FDIC insuring? How much deposits? All this stuff that says... Up to $250,000 of, you know, deposits insured at the banks. Well, how much are you trying to insure? Oh, it's only $9.9 .9 trillion of deposits. How much do you currently have available to you that in case something were to happen, can you cover the $9.9 .9 trillion? It's going to be fine. Can you show us the balance sheet? So some people post this on Twitter and it went viral. To protect the $9.9 .9 trillion, you see, so it, says, it says insured deposits. This is their balance sheet, the FDIC's balance sheet. You see how much the fund balance has? Only $125 billion. <laughs> only $125 billion they have. How are you going to protect everybody with only $125 billion at $9.9 .9 trillion? How are you going to do it, FDIC? And they're like, oh, my God. People are panicking. Phone call, phone call, phone call. I'm assuming... They're having conference calls. You cannot let this happen. We have to get people to relax. Unemployment is low. We got to keep it low. We, we can't get people to panic. What if they start all of a sudden taking their monies out of banks? And we cannot, everybody has to cover these stories. This is not good. This is tragic. This is scary. Okay. But well, people are learning now a little bit of the FDIC situation. 
So then, you know the money, the stimulus that we did in COVID? Look at the right and look at the left. In 2008, the TARP program that they did, which was roughly $800 billion, do you see when you zoom in where it says January 2009, between January 2009 and January 2008, in that uh, the, the, the glass that is had that's looking at uh, where we're at, that's $800 billion. Can you even see the subtle increase? Look how subtle it is, right? Now go to the right. Look what COVID stimulus look like. Skyrocketed. Look at the angle, what it looks like, okay, when we did this. So now, this man here has got a tough job, okay? Uh, there are a lot of jobs you can have. You can be a president. You can be a lot of different jobs today. It's very hard to have this guy's job. He does not have an easy job because what he's going through today, no Fed share has ever gone through because the current climate is very unique, and I'll explain to you why. So there's two ways he can take this. He can take the Ben Bernanke route and be dovish, or he can take the Paul Volcker route and be hawkish. So Ben Bernanke was a Fed chair from 2006 to 2014. It was under President Bush and Obama. And the biggest problem he was facing was a 2008 crisis during his eight years of being in office. So interest rates, height was 5%, low, 0%. It's a pretty decent time to do what he did. And his problem was 2008, okay? So now Volcker on the right, look at him. Fed share from 79 to 87, it was Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan. Biggest problem was inflation, and it was the worst in a long time. Height, 19%, and the low was 6%. Height, 19% is where it was at. So Powell, if you had the job, you would say, I want to see the data of what the guys before me did and how they handled this. Some of them you can call to ask for advice. Some of them you can't call, right? So let me see the case study. What do they do here? What do they do that? What should we do here? And here's what we saw. Ben Bernanke, similar to 2020, 2021 Powell. Powell used Bernanke's strategy in 2020, 2021. But Powell used Volcker's strategy in 2022 to now. So on the left, the Bernanke strategy was trading comfort today for pain tomorrow. Hey, let's lower interest rates. Let's make sure we're good now. But man, the next generation, our kids and grandkids will pay a price for it. But come on, let's at least us be good right now. We can't lose all our money right now. Versus the Paul Volcker style is like, no, no, we can't give this inheritance to our kids. We got to take a hit in the economy now so we can have a better economy for them. It's unfair for us to give them our screw up of what we did, which is kind of noble. So then Bernanke, middle and lower class priced out out of real estate, can't afford it. 2006, houses, million dollars. I can't afford to buy a million dollars. This thing was $400,000 just six years ago. Well, it's a million dollars now, but I can't afford to buy it. I can't make a payment like that. I get it, but other people are in legit. No income, no assets. Just tell us what income you got. Finance it anyways. You know, and, and, you know, get a low interest rate. Get two-year interest only. It's going to be great. I was just talking to my guy about buying commercial real estate. I'm looking at this building that we're uh, uh, wanting to uh, made an offer on from $89 million to $69 million to $59 million to $46 million, okay? And to $46 million, the people that are in it right now that we were talking to, we had a meeting with them two, three months ago, they can't get the financing completed. Why? Because of what's going on right now, Okay. People cannot, so the funding, the interest rates, all of a sudden, all the loans that they got on short-term interest rates, we can get it, get it. Interest rates are going to stay low for all of us forever. Boom. Hello. Rates are no longer 2.9% at 6.5%. Your payment is officially this. Can you make it? Uh, 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 can you give us 30 more days? I'll give you 30 more days. Uh, 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 what do we do now? You got to sell some of your assets. We got to figure something out. And then boom. Next one, the Paul Walker route is asset prices goes down and unemployment goes up. Either way, this one pain is a different kind of a pain than this. Powell has used both strategies, which is kind of off and a little bit weird. So what do we do next? So when you look at this here, this tells you a story here. The Volcker years, you see from 79 to 87, this is what he was dealing with. You see inflation all the way at the top, 19%. And if you go to the bottom, you don't see anything below 6% pretty much. Not unemployment, uh, interest rates is what you see. 19 at the high, 6% at the bottom, okay? These numbers today, people would panic if we got to 19%. So this is more Bernanke. It was the high of five and a quarter, and then he brought it down and kept at less than half a point. 
for 128 months. That's why they call it the 128-month economic expansion. People making money left and right, fake success left and right. Oh, let me get another $50 million line. Let me get another $10 million line at such and such interest rate. Money is free. Get it as much as you want. We're going to be like this forever. What they don't realize is they screwed it up for their kids and grandkids because it can't be this easy. Money can't be this cheap. It's fake if it's this cheap. But they said, keep doing it. It's working. Don't tell anybody. We're going to have to pay a price 10 years from now. Keep rolling the dice. It's cool. A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then boom. Here's what happens. Powell used the old strategy the last two years. And now he's using the new strategy the last 12 months. Okay? So what's the difference? Here's what you got to look at. The challenge he's got is the following. Bernanke had a crisis with low inflation, 2 to 4%. Volcker had inflation uh, with a low debt to GDP ratio, 30 to 40 percent debt to GDP ratio. That was his. You know what Powell's is? Powell is dealing with high inflation and high debt to GDP. He's got both of their problems at the same time happening. What do you do? Six to nine percent inflation and a hundred to 130 percent debt to GDP ratio. What do you do with that? So this is what I'm telling you. This is this guy's got a tough job. One minute, everyone's telling him, hey, let's go to a Bernanke route. Another minute, like, no, no, no. Let's go to Volcker route. No, no, no. Let's go this route. What are we going to do here? I can't make up my mind. So he's like flip-flopping. I go this route. I go that. I go this route. I go this route. Rather than sticking to his guns, to one philosophy, people behind closed doors are constantly influencing, influencing him to change his approach and watch what just recently happened, which a lot of people are not talking about. You see this right here? The Fed made a huge move last week that no one is talking about. Look at the top right. Do you see the top right? Okay. That magnifying glass shows you a small little tick up above that $8 million. Do you see that? It doesn't look like a big number. How big of a deal is that? It's not really that big of a deal. Here's what they just did last week. Okay. They added $300 billion, okay, to their balance sheet just one day. The Fed just decided to add $300 billion to their balance sheet in one day. So what does this mean? Let me kind of undo this to show you what he did for the last six months, okay? If you look at this, look at the chart of where it went, where it says 8.639. Obviously, that's in billions, okay, in millions. So if you look at that $300 billion they just added to now $8.69 trillion, okay, that's what the $300 billion is, you go back five months ago, or six months ago to November, we were the same. So whatever he's done the last five or six months, they just undid. All of these increasing the rates, increasing the rates, increasing the rates, they just undid by adding $300 billion to the balance sheet. Pat, what are you saying? They undid the vocal strategy he was taking. Now he went back to the Bernanke strategy. So that's what it looks like, okay? $300 billion added. No one's talking about it. No one's talking about it. And, there was, you know, the bigger bank CEOs are coming out and saying, yo, you know, we got $2 trillion. If, if we're not going to let these regional banks go out of business in the communities, they're going to be safe. And they got another $2 trillion added into it that in case something happens, I know my friends at the big five banks, they're not going to tap into that. It's going to be the regional and the community ones. We're not going to let these banks go out of business. What does that sound like, putting more money into the economy? That's what you call quantitative easing. Where do you think that money goes to? To the big banks, okay? That money's going to roll back to them is what's going to happen. The bigger banks don't care. The bigger banks benefit from something like this, okay, when this happens. But you and I, we kind of have to pay for this, okay? The price goes back to you. And matter of fact, low and middle income, they pay the biggest price because that whole concept, these guys get up on stage, sound so noble, like Robin Hood, you know, it's like, let me tell you, it's not fair that the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. You, you just added $300 billion to the balance sheet that if you have to build these guys, that that money is going to who? Who's that money going to? If you decide to bail out these other regional and communities, where is that money going to? Tell me. Is that money going to go in the hands of uh, the, the small guy? Is it going to go to the middle income guys? Who's that money going to go to? How about the guy that's making small money? And all of a sudden, we got a new guy that's rich. Oh, look at all this money that they're making. Look how awesome this is. They sound noble, but they're catastrophic. Powell was this close of going through what he was going through. Maybe he increased 5% in 12 months. Maybe that was a little bit too dramatic because when you see what happens here next, it'll tell you a story. But we were so close 
and taking the Volcker route, which was the Reagan side, to come out of what Carter did, but we went back to the Bernanke route. So now, bank term funding program. After Silicon Valley, the, uh, the Fed set up a program to prevent another event like it from happening. Silicon Valley Bank lost money selling bonds before maturity. The Fed has guaranteed credit for bank bonds at 100% of the bond value. You know what that means? Don't worry about it. Take all the risk. We'll bail you out at 100%, at 100% of your bond value. What if it's not worth that? Don't worry. We got you. It's going to be cool. Okay. Let me go back to being reckless again. That's what kind of happens. Because it's like the kid that no matter every time he gets in trouble, mommy and daddy bail him out. So that kid becomes a spoiled, rotten kid. And it's because of mommy and daddy. And in this situation, mommy and daddy is the government and the Fed. That's what happens. And these bankers at the top become spoiled because every time they go out of their way to bail these guys out, and they've become spoiled little brats without letting any one of these guys go out of business. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life, and I paid a price for it, and it sucked. Some of it took me a year to recover from my mistake. Some of it took me five years to recover from a mistake, okay? Five years. One of it took me seven years to recover from my mistake. It's supposed to suck. When you take a risk and you're reckless and you're not responsible, there's a price to be paid for it, right? This is going on in front of our eyes and a lot of people are sitting around saying, are we going to be okay with this? We're about to find out what happens next. Watch this. BTFP uh, uh, is a game changer. Bank term funding program they just launched. The margin will be 100% of par value. You know what this means? They're going to protect the banks no matter what it is with the bonds. It's lost money. It's no longer worth what it was before. Don't worry about it. We're going to protect that at 100% of par value. Okay? <laughs> it's so funny. I mean, if the average investor is like going to the casino – playing roulette, playing any game you want to play, and the boss uh, uh, of the casino comes to you and says, listen, don't worry about it. You want to play $100,000? Don't worry. Play reckless. Put $100,000 on 36. Boom. I didn't get it. Another $100,000. Don't worry. 22. I lost it all. Oh my. Another $100,000. What a noble guy this is. Where's that money coming from? Where's that money coming from? It's coming from somewhere. It is coming from somewhere. So where is the risk? There is no risk for these guys. There is no risk. The risk is for you, but there's no risk for these guys. So at least inflation is going down, right? A lot of people are saying, well, inflation is going down. It's great. Look, look at the numbers. We are below what we were before and uh, from a year ago. It's fantastic. Everybody should be happy. Really? I I is that really the case? H have we always measured success of inflation going down on a 12-month marker or a 24-month marker? Meaning... Isn't it supposed to be where inflation is at today versus two years ago to say if we're higher or if we're lower? Huh. Because if that's the case, inflation is still very high, but they're not selling it that way because I think they just changed something. So let's take a look at this. This is kind of interesting. Every year on February 14th, there's a celebration of love. This February, BLS, which is the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, Government, the Consumer Price Index, which we hope you uh, will love, beginning with January 2023 index, scheduled for publication on February 14, 2023, BLS plans to update the spending weights in the calculation of CPI every year instead of every two years. What? Yeah, every year instead of every two years. Why are you doing that? Well, we're just changing it. Isn't that great? Because it's the power of positive thinking. You don't have to know the negative stuff. Let's just stay positive, and that's how we're going to fix the economy, by us staying positive. Isn't that kind of cool? I, I, don't, I don't understand what you're saying here. Yes. So they change the way they measure it. Here's what it means. The typical way we've always measured uh, uh, inflation is two years, meaning where is inflation at today versus where we were two years ago. If we measure where inflation is at today versus two years ago, which is 1.7%, the numbers are real, scary, versus if you measure where inflation is at today versus where inflation was at a year ago, 7.9%, they get to say inflation is down. So here's how it looks. Old way, measurement of two years, new way, measurement of one year. Old way, CPI February was 2021, and 2021 was 1.7, new way. Let's go back to February of 2022. It was 7.9%. We're getting better. Old way, current inflation is 6%. New way, current inflation is 6%. Old way, 
inflation is up still 4.3%. In the new measurement, inflation is down 1.9%. <laughs> Do you see what they're doing? Do you see how this all, by the way, everything I'm sharing with you, go to your own due diligence and research and all that stuff for yourself. We're just giving you stuff off the government website. We're not giving you stuff that is off blogs. This is off the Bureau of Labor Statistics website, stuff that you can go look up yourself as well. So now let's continue. The Fed also just int uh, raised interest rates, quarter of a basis point, which, by the way, I kind of like the fact that they did that. They stuck to their guns. Some people were afraid he was going to do half a point, but he went up only a quarter of a basis point. Uh, everyone's wondering what he's going to do, ne do next. Is he going to do quarter, quarter? Is he going to do half quarter? Is he going to do nothing? Then he's going to go half quarter. We don't know. Obviously, we will see what happens because if there is another bank or two or three that this happens to, like Silicon Valley Bank, they may not do anything for a couple months and go back to the Bernanke way of managing the crisis that we have today. So this is all new, and the outcome is very uncertain. Nobody really knows what they're talking about, including myself. I'm just saying to you what's going on today in the marketplace. Everybody I talk to at Goldman, at Morgan, you watch the guys on television, everybody's telling you, nobody's been here before. We're all playing it by ears to see what's going to happen. Part of it is control what you can control. Part of it is there's certain things we have zero control over. If your name's not Yellen, if your name's not Powell, if your name's not Biden, if your name's not one of the five CEOs of major banks in America, Jamie Dimon and some of these other guys, you're probably not going to be, be involved in much of these decision-making process. This is what is going on today, and they're all trying to learn how to get out of this mess while they're learning and they're doing, and they have to sound confident and optimistic with you and I. This is all happening at the same time. So now, remember how I told you we increased 5% in one year? In 2008, 2004 to 2008, they raised interest rates 4%, but they did it in two years. And that, that's going to affect the economy. This time we did five years, 5% 5 in one year. That's a lot in a year. That's what a lot of people are talking about. This is kind of why we're facing what we're facing right now with banks sitting there saying, I can't afford to make my payments right now. What are we going to do? So unemployment, okay? If you look at this, unemployment will skyrocket is what a lot of people are talking about. In 2005 to 2010, if you look at this, 2005 to 2019, unemployment was below 6%. It was below 4.5% in around 2007. And then all of a sudden went up to 6, 7.5, 9, 10%. They're afraid of this. This is what they're afraid of. Because when this happened in 2008, and we haven't experienced, by the way, COVID has got nothing to do with this. Well, COVID kind of, COVID had nothing to do with the economy. COVID, had not, COVID was COVID, had nothing to do with the economy. This is the real economy we're talking about here. The last time when this happened in 2008, when unemployment went the race that it went, here's what happened to suicide rate in America from 2007, 8, 9, 10. Do you see the numbers exceeding? That's what it was like. 4,750 excess death that took place. It's scary. I remember I was in that economy. That's what they're doing to the economy right now. So for me, I make a lot of calls and I talk to a lot of business owners, small business owners, entrepreneurs. Two years ago when I'm talking to them, they were afraid of what COVID is going to do to their business. In 2021, a lot of them are making more money than ever before. 2022, they were uncertain. People I'm talking to right now, we're sitting on a few million dollars. They're not as confident as they were a year ago. I'm having different kind of conversations with people today. This is reality of what's coming right now. New startups vanished in 2008 when they took this approach. Look at the 2007 to 2009 chart. Look what happened with the number of startups. It went all the way down to numbers we had in 1994, even lower than the numbers we had in 1994. We all know small business owners employ nearly 49% of people in America have a job because of a small business owner. What happens when we lose small startups? Okay, they're not getting funding anymore. What happens with those guys? Because, you know, the banks tighten, and they don't lend the way that they typically do. Startups pay a price for it. So now here is a number of births and deaths after 2008. Look at this. Birth went up, 2002, 3, 4. We're having a lot of babies. We're on fire from 93. Having babies, 94, 95, 96, 97. We're having babies, 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 babies. 2008, all of a sudden, boom, it flips on us. Births goes down, death goes up. People are scared with what they're doing. Now, I'm not trying to scare the crap out of you right now. Trust me. I was in that economy, and it was scary. I got involved in this business in the 2001 economy, 9-11. My first day was 9-10, okay, day before 
I started off being scared about this industry and having to be paranoid because I was in a bad market for a few years. I never thought this thing was going to work out for me. I thought I was going to go back to the military because I didn't think this was going to happen for me, being the financial industry. Got involved by possibly the worst time you could have gotten involved in the financial industry the last 40 years. 9, 10, 2001, okay? A day before 9, 11. Let's take a quick time out. If you're going through it right now, a couple things I want you to be thinking about. Don't make any irresponsible decisions right now. Delay them till next year. I'm talking a lot of weird decisions right now people want to make. Delay till next year. Just because you're in this place right now doesn't mean it'll remain like this forever, okay? Keep yourself busy with as many positive distractions as possible and avoid having too much time on, on your hands. Let me give you a couple things here about this message I'm giving to you. Alcohol, don't touch it right now. Try to avoid it. Any kind of sleep medication, any of that stuff, my recommend, I'm not a doctor, I'm not giving you, I'm just telling you like, you see a lot of this stuff happening to people right now, and they kind of want to numb themselves to not go through this pain. You were a real estate guy making 100 grand a month. You're not now. You're making seven grand a month, and you and your wife and family are going through a lot of issues. You had to give away that car of yours, the Lambo, the Rolls. You were going to sushi spots. Now you're eating at Chipotle, and you're eating the Chipotle bowls is what you're doing with that red dressing that they have. But it ain't sushi. It, it, it ain't Maestro's. It ain't Fleming's. It ain't that sushi spot you were going to and having sea urchin anymore. Okay, now you're going back to Ghetto California Roll at a Kroger's or Publix or Albertsons or Ralph's. I don't know where you live in. That's what you're kind of going back to. And it's embarrassing because you went from the rock star going to parties with a nice three-piece suit on and a nice watch. And now you're going out there and it's the same clothes and you're kind of embarrassed and afraid because people are looking at you and people can sense fear, right? If you're thinking about getting a divorce, wait two years. If you still feel like getting a divorce in two years, do it. If you're thinking about throwing the towel in right now, wait two years. If you feel like that, then consider it then, but not right now. No major crazy life-making decisions today. None. Just go through this season and a couple things that I'll share with you here to help you out. Idle time. Scary right now if you got too much idle time. Nobody can think straight. Who does not work? Idleness warps the mind. Henry Ford. Anytime I've ever done anything stupid in my life, I had too much time on my hand. I was a young guy, got out of the military. I didn't have a job for about a month. My hair color was orange because I had peroxide in it. And I was going to Zuma Beach in LA, you know, whatever, Malibu. And I was putting peroxide. If you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, like, why would you put peroxide in this hair? Trust me, don't go try this at home and go put peroxide in here saying, hey, how come this happened to my hair? I had nothing to do. I had way too much time on my hands. I was doing the dumbest things at that time because I had too much time on my hands, okay? Number two, purge your mind of all aimless and idle thoughts, especially those that pry into the affairs of others or wish them ill. This is a wrong time to be thinking about, I hope that guy goes out of business. I hope that guy goes bankrupt. I hope that guy does this. I hope that... Don't even let your mind consume any of those thoughts. I had somebody come to our house the other day, and this person was talking about, let me tell you, those people are evil, and that person is this, and that person is this, and these people. I'm like, I don't even want to put those thoughts in my head right now. Everybody's dealing with something right now, okay? Everybody is. I am, you are, we all are. The wealthy people are, the politicians are, Jerome Powell is. Trust me, everybody's dealing with something right now. I want everybody to have a good life, and I want everybody to do their parts and have their dreams become a reality. So my focus is really my life and doing what I can do with my life. Don't be thinking about hoping other things, you know, bad things happen to other people. They got to also go through it just like you're going through it right now. Trouble springs from idleness and grievous toil from needless ease. Benjamin Franklin. Next, Thomas Jefferson. Determine never to be idle. No person will have occasion to complain of the want of time who never loses any. It is wonderful how much can be done if we are always doing. This is a season to be doing. This is not a season to be sitting around. This is by far the worst time to be sitting around, not doing, in idle time, worried about how this economy is going to affect you. So things to keep in mind during turbulent times. You need to, uh, uh, you need to write emotional response, especially if you're in a leadership position, your father, your parent, your CEO, your boss, your sales leader, your manager, your supervisor. People are looking at you to show poise. It doesn't mean you're a robot. It doesn't mean you're a machine. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect, but they're leaning on you to be able to hold yourself together and stay strong. Okay, You need the right strategies at a time like this. When I went through this, 
I was not the best salesperson. I had no clue what I was doing. Every time I was working at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter and I was doing what I was doing, uh, not knowing if I'm going to make it or not, every day, all I kept telling myself, Pat, why are you putting yourself to do this? Just go back in the Army, man. You were great in the Army. Go do 20 years. You were 63 Bravo, Hummer mechanic, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. You still got a bunch of friends. You know the streets. You know what to do. You know the formation. You know the acronyms. You know all the stuff. You were good at it, man. Just go back. Just go back. You're going to get a bonus if you join. You'll pay off your debt. You know, do 20 years. You'll get out at 38 years old. You'll have a pension to pay you for the rest of your life. Maybe 50%. If you do 30 years, maybe you'll get 75% or 100%. If you get disability, get 100%. Just go do that. Why aren't you not doing that? That's all I was thinking about. Okay, while I'm going through 9-11, I'm like, dude, this is the worst position I could have been in, getting my Series 7 license right after 9-11 takes place. You could have joined this four years ago. You would have made some kind of money. At least you would have summoned savings. No, you got involved in the worst time. Just go in the Army. So I needed the right strategies because I was not making it in selling. I was not a good salesperson in the high-ticket items. I could sell five ten dollars products, maybe $100 products, maybe even $1,000 products. I did not know how to sit down with millionaires at Morgan Stanley selling them a million-dollar fund or roll over $400,000 in their 401k in 2001. I didn't know how to do that. You need to maintain a level of poise. This is very valuable right now to be able to stay poised in a time like this, okay? Everybody is watching you if you're a leader, and if you're not, if you are a regular guy, you're not a leader. You're, you're, you're a person that may be a potential future superstar. This is when people will identify. Let me tell you, I'm really impressed by that guy. Look how poised he is. Look how poised she is. In the family, look how poised that person is. Look how poised this person is. You show signs of future leadership in seasons like this. Unfortunately, times of crisis is a great filtering system to identify who's a real leader and who's not. You can never tell who's a real leader in good times. You can only tell who's a real leader with poise during bad times only. Good times, fake, bad times, real leadership is exposed. You need to have the right level of urgency to find a solution. It's not a time to sit around and be thinking about what about this and what about that and what about this. Buffett says something very uh, powerful Years ago, it says it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. If you think about what, you'll do things differently. If you think about that, you'll do things differently, right? You got 20 years, you've done the right things, five minutes to ruin it. That's why I said if you're about to make a bad decision, you know, marriage, kids, finances, all this stuff, take two years before you make a big decision because even though times may be hard, if you were good at what you were doing a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, you've learned a lot. This is just a bad time you're in right now. And it's a time that none of us have ever experienced in the history of America before that all things are hitting at the same time to the economy. You ain't been through this before, okay? And partially, you're not at fault. But it is your responsibility and my responsibility to do the best with whatever hands that we've been dealt right now. That's the moves we got to make, okay? You and I, especially if you consider yourself a leader. And by the way, if you're on a podcast like this, you're on a show like this, you're watching this webinar right now, a lot of people are not on this. Think about how many people could have been on this. They're not on this. Why not? They're watching a show. They're, they're probably watching a Netflix show. They're probably listening to music right now. They're watching YouTube videos. They don't have time for this. They're sitting around worried, stressed out, idle time, checking Instagram stories, checking TikTok stories. You chose to take the time to get on something like this. This means you're showing leadership qualities yourself. Kudos to you. Not a lot of people are doing it right now. They're trying to go through this in a way to eliminate the pressure and what's really going on. But you're saying, I want to face the reality and I want to get some, get some strategies that can work for me. I applaud you for it. So how to approach a crisis like this? What caused it? Is it in your control or out of your control? Quantifying the risk of crisis, worst case scenario. What's the worst thing that's going to happen here? Really, let's think about what's the worst thing that's going to happen here. A market crash, you know, a bad one, 20%, 30%. Could depression really take place? Could a war take place? How bad can this thing get? Can it get very bad to the point that it could cause me to lose my job, lose my clients? Okay. Am I the first person that's going through this? No. How long do you think this will last? You think this will last for 10 years? No. You think it's a five-year deal? No. You think it's a one-year, two-year deal? Most likely. Okay. I can kind of go through that, but I want to come out of it a winner is what I want to come. I don't want to just come out worse than what I am today. I want to be able to come out with a higher market value than before. Great. That's the right way of thinking. Three, confront the crisis with the right level of urgency. Sometimes when issues happen in our lives, we're kind of like, ah, I got time. It's okay. Next month, next week, next this. Next. Yeah, you can't, you can't afford to do that right now. You can afford to do that in good times. You, you cannot afford to not have urgency in bad times like this. 
Zero. You cannot afford to have it. Find the roots of the crisis to eliminate future repetition of the event. Maybe the industry you're a part of. Maybe a product you're selling. Maybe you didn't save enough money. Maybe you bought one too many exotics. Maybe you bought one too many watches. Maybe you didn't take advantage of the market when it was doing very good and you sat on the sidelines. You're like, man, I didn't even make any money, Pat. I've never even experienced making money. Maybe you need to get into the market. Maybe you need to play ball. Maybe you need to stop sitting on the sidelines. That's not working for you. What we do know is with all of the stuff that's going on in the marketplace right now, Making six figures today, you got to get your income to a whole different level. You got to position yourself in a place with a company that upside is big long term for you. You have to be starting to think about those thoughts. Depending on your age, you may be 35 right now with two kids saying, hey, man, I got to kind of start thinking about long term for myself. Exactly. But find the roots of the crisis to eliminate future repetition of the event. Create a battle plan, both defensive and offensive. So now, timeline of crisis. Okay, one hour. Don't turn a issue that you need to resolve in an hour and let it last a day. Don't let an issue that's supposed to last only a day and let it linger for a week. You're wasting your time. Don't let a crisis that a one-week-long crisis take a month of your life. Don't let a month crisis take a quarter. Don't let a quarter take a year. Don't, t- don't let a year take a decade away from you. Learn to condense time frames. In times like this while you're going through this crisis, don't be overthinking your decision. We got to go. We got to go. We got to be decisive in a time like this. You know what's the book I recommended this last podcast that we talked about? How to make decisive decisions. The book's book's title, the book's entire premise was around how to make decisive decisions now in this climate. Because it's important to make. That's a very valuable skill set today to make. So now let me show you this. I... uh, uh, Kai, we came out with this chart, what, uh, two years ago, three years ago? I think it's two years ago, two or three years ago when we were in Boca. And this this is what the whole concept was. The last 20-some years, ever since I got out of the military and I've been working in free market, free enterprise, uh, financial industry, I've watched a lot of my peers and my competitors, and here's what I noticed. If you look at the bottom right, the red represents the 1%. The orange represents the 10% of your industry. Yellow represents 20%. And... The green represents 80% of people in your field, okay? Here's what I learned. I learned that almost everybody can work just as hard as anybody on any given day. Almost everybody can work as hard as anybody on any given week. But they can't do it over a month span, over a quarter, over a year, over a decade. That's when they get exposed. See, if you look at the difference between the red, it's all the way at the top, okay? When they're running and gunning, they're running at nine and a half, but their low only gets as low as eight. If you look at the top 10%, when they're running and gunning, they can compete with the 1% at nine and a half, but when they're cruising, they drop all the way down to six. When you look at the top 20%, at the top, they can compete with the 1% at nine and a half, but when they're chilling, their low drops to four. And if you look at the green, the green will get to an eight and a half. They'll never work as hard as everybody else. But with their bottom, when they're cruising, when times are hard, man, they truly disappear. And it takes them years to recover from it. I don't know which one you are, okay? Just by being on this here, I'm assuming you're automatically probably in the 20% or higher. But whichever one you are, remember when people lap you or they get past you or they beat you. It's typically, typically during scary times while a lot of people are in idle, not doing anything, it's just kind of like, well, you know, oh my God, you know, the times are very hard. I can't find a job. I can't do this. I can't do that. They make urgent decisions and move. Do not be the person that you use a bad season like this to say, this is why I'm not working as hard because there's just not any business out there. There's just not any clients out there. There's plenty of business out there to do for the people that are going above and beyond and doing what others are not willing to do. Next, skills dictates your value in the marketplace today. We're hiring a bunch of people right now. In this building right now, we have, what is the number? 65 full-time employees. We have 65 full-time employees. Now, a year ago, we were at 25. A year prior to that, we were at eight, okay? So we went from eight to 25 to now 65, and we can't fit in this building. If I open that door and you come into this building, people are sitting on top of each other, literally. We bought another building that we turned into a comedy club and a cigar lounge. Now, people are going to be working out of there. We've made multiple offers to buy different buildings in community because we need more space. People are hiring today. We, 
currently have 18 job openings today, positions right now, whether it's sales, editor-in-chief, VP of studios, president of studios. We have so many different manager and director of our consulting firm. We got so many job openings today that we're looking, okay, ourselves. So what are people looking for? I did a training this week just to talk to my guys to see how good they are at sales and negotiation because my job is to train the trainers to make sure all my guys know how to negotiate, all my guys know how to sell. How good are you at selling yourself? How good are your people at selling? How good are the people you're working with at negotiating? What skill sets are you adding in an economy like this to separate yourself from everybody else in the marketplace? Well, this is this is me in the in the picture to the right. That's that's a if you look at says 2001. That's exactly right after 9/11. The girl in the back, right behind that uh, uh, white flash, that's a girl named Soul. We were sharing the same desk at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter Building in Glendale. I am in that picture, 22 years old. In that picture, I'm 22 years old, okay? The picture to the left, I'm in my office in Northridge. I'm sitting on my computer looking at what's going on with those old earpieces. Look at that old earpiece. Before Apple came out with their earpiece, the earpod, what did they call it? Earpods? Is that what it's called? The earpods? That's the ghetto ones. I don't even know what they called it back in the days, but it was, it is what that's what the Nextel combination. I got my CDs in the corner. You see that CD box at the top? I'm listening to CDs. I'm constantly trying to figure out ways to improve with that camel hair jacket of mine who was so hot, I'm wearing it in LA while it's 100 degrees, right? Trying to look like I know what I'm doing. But I am in the hunt. I'm in the office early. I'm in the office late. I'm extremely paranoid. I'm extremely concerned about what's going on. But at the same time, I am so optimistic because I'm smelling opportunity. That kid right there, I call him kid. It was 28 years old. That guy right there is so flipping hungry. He sees an opportunity and he knows this is his chance to become the hero to his family. I, at 44, I'm grateful to both of these guys. <laughs> I look at this right now and I say thank you to both of them because the guy on the right, and 22 years old, he was a little too good at partying. So the fact that he kind of put it on pause, I'm proud of him. And the guy right there, while he was having some success, he did not slow down to celebrate, oh my God, look how special you are. He kept saying, I can do a little bit more at the next phase because I'm going to be able to have my family's dreams become a reality. And I was in recreation mode. It's not easy to do because what recreation mode is, mode is to tell yourself, I'm not good enough for the next phase. So I learned the skill set of sales. Then I learned how to become a sales leader. By the way, learning how to be a sales leader, this helps you in everything you do in life. Just so you know, Trump is a salesperson and he's a sales leader. Okay. Um, Obama is a salesperson and a sales leader. J just so you know this, by the way. Bill Clinton, for sure, he's a salesperson and a sales leader. Even Bush, even Reagan, Kennedy, Nixon, these guys learn how to sell and how to drive people. Sales leaders know how to move people. I knew how to sell, but I hadn't learned how to uh, drive salespeople myself. So then I became a CEO. Each time I learned new skill set, that increased my market value. I didn't know what it was to be a CEO. I was a business owner, but I was not a good CEO. I spent $50,000 and went and lived in Boston for three weeks at Harvard Business School at their OPM program to learn how to become a CEO. So I was a terrible CEO. I was a good business owner. I was not a good CEO. I didn't know what to track. I didn't know what to do on a daily basis. I knew at each phase, I had to recreate myself. Just like this iPhone, which system are we on right now? Is it iOS 14 or 15, whatever it is? Just like this thing has upgrades, you need to have your own upgrades. Maybe you were good for the last level, but you ain't good for the next level. So what are you doing to recreate yourself in a season like this? Sales is a skill that changed my life. If you got value out of this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. I got two other things I want you to think about as well. One, if you want to know what drives you, your personality during a time like this, are you scared? What gets you to move in a time like this? We created this quiz for you to learn about yourself. If you've never taken this quiz before to see which one the four you fall under, click here, take the quiz. The other one is how to make tough decisions. A video we did four years ago. If you've never seen it, click here to watch it. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.